Welcome and thank you for attending Hawthorne University's webinar series. I'm Paula Bartholomew, the Director of Online Events, and I'm always pleased to be here together and facilitate our presentations. I want to let you know we'll have time for question and answers at the end of this presentation, and we'll certainly respond to your questions or comments, but I encourage you to write them into the webinar question panel at any time so that you're in queue. And just so you know that if you have your hand up as an attendee, I don't know what your question is unless you put it in the panel. So, And I expect that we're going to have a terrific uh, information here in this webinar. So I want you to know, you know that we're recording this, and it will be available for replay on our website real soon. And if you're listening for the first time, I want to let you know that Hawthorne University's Holistic Health and Nutrition webinar series is a platform bringing excellent information and resources for our students, our alumni, and faculty to augment their Hawthorne education and to expose us to the wealth of knowledge and experience our guest presenters bring to the table again and again. You know, the many ways our students and grads are using their Hawthorne education and their practices is nothing short of amazing to me. We have a variety of degree and certificate programs at Hawthorne, some of those pursuing a clinical track with the goal of working directly with clients, and we have other programs that are de dedicated to those that are seeking to primarily educate, whether that be writing books or develop courses, workshops, programs, do public speaking, or teach for a school. And then we have other options for those who simply want to learn valuable, credible information in a conducive environment. The success of our students is a testament to Hawthorne's mission and principles to provide quality, affordable, holistic health and nutrition education. And these are open to the interested public, too, because we always want everybody to learn more at Hawthorne. And that brings me to today and, uh, and the opportunity to welcome Dan Glenn Depke to share his presentation on the art and science of iridology. I'm going to do that again, Glenn, because <laughs> I want to welcome you properly <laughs> <laughs> to say that you're going to share your presentation on the art and science of iridology. All right. You know, I just think this is such a good topic. And I think that Glenn's presentation will demonstrate what we can glean about our health from the eyes. And I'll be delighted that these strategies will be reinforced with a case example, too. So let me give you a little bit of background on Glenn. He's a traditional naturopath, and he studied with the leaders in functional medicine for the last 18 years at least in order to fine-tune his healing approach. Glenn has earned his degrees in natural health and iridology and has deservedly become known as a master in functional healing and customized nutrition. And of course, he champions the wonderful Depke Wellness Clinic. It's a pleasure to have you with us again, Glenn. No, it's, it's always my pleasure to be here and share whatever I can to ha help everybody on board. Well, that's the point. So we'll be able to learn from your expertise so that we can understand and actually incorporate this information on our methodology. So thanks a lot. And, you know, I think especially this is especially key because it's been said that eyes have long been referred to as windows of the soul, right? So... <laughs> Yes, they are. Lead us in, Glenn. Lead us into our eyes of the soul, right? <laughs> okay, well, uh, excellent. Well, thank you, Paula. And uh, yes, this is going to be a lot of fun today in uh, really discovering what iridology is all about and how we can actually incorporate this in our practice to uh, really provide some just underlying understanding of what we may look deeper for with the clients that we're working with. So uh, special thanks, first off, always to Hawthorne University. Uh, it's, uh, I'm so appreciative that Hawthorne provides not only education, but uh, also outside of that, the, these type of webinars and online education, not only for students and, uh, and those alumni, but also for uh, you know, very often the general public, because the information on here is just invaluable, and uh, this is all thanks to Hawthorne. So my special thanks goes out to Hawthorne on a regular basis. And the first part of, before we get into iridology, is just to clear up the name. Uh, iridology is the study of the eye. Uh, very often people uh, will say iridology, and just to let you know, it is not the study of the ear. So when you're referring to iridology, uh, you could refer to, to this as iridology, knowing that you have the product, uh, correct pronunciation. That's a great place to start with this for everybody. And a little bit of the history of iridology. 
The oldest recorded history of iris analysis dates back to uh, 1000 BC, and in that time what was known as Central Asia. Uh, in 1967 was the first recognition of organ division of the iris according to body regions uh, that we're going to be discussing with some, some pictures of irises today for all of us to review. And really during the first half of the 20th century, iris analysis was used primarily by medical doctors even here in the U.S. You see in a lot of other countries, most of Europe, Australia, uh, this is conventional medicine. And for even doctors here in the U.S., this was also conventional medicine until uh, really the, our system, current system of westernized medicine came to fruition. And at, at that point, there was no longer the need uh, at the time to uh, really understand some of the deeper underlying issues because we went into that whole symptom and uh, and prescription model that we still use today conventionally. And it's to me, iridology is really the ultimate preventive medicine tool. Uh, you know, the one thing to, to clear up with this is because I think a lot of people, uh, I would even say unfortunately, utilize iridology as a, a, a very specific diagnostic tool. And, and to me, when you're looking at the iris, it just gives us the underlying information that we could use in our practice of what we might look further at. And, and I'll give you, as we go through this today, is some of these different signs that we're gonna see in some of these iris pictures, I'm gonna tell you in that point what I would do with that to take the information that we're seeing from the iris just a little bit deeper. Uh, because you know, I, I personally and professionally in my practice don't use it as the end all of a recommendation. I use it as a tool to help me understand areas that I need to look at a little bit deeper. And so with this, the iris analysis gives us that window to understand the potential challenges based on predispositions as shown in the iris, both genetically and functionally. We're going to get into some of that uh, in the presentation today. And with this information, you can, you can help your clients make proper lifestyle decisions to really prevent diseases or, as mentioned earlier, to look deeper on that level. And then also understand how the, the whole an energetic and emotional basis can create an underlying vibrational challenges in an area already showing a weakened predisposition. So I'll, I'll tie in a little bit of the mental emotional uh, into the functional as we go through this. This should be a lot of fun and provide information that everybody can utilize in their practice uh, starting tomorrow or people can utilize for themselves you know, ending this webinar and going into uh, the next room and looking in the mirror and seeing what you're seeing in your iris as well. So how does this work? This is a big question a lot of people ask. Well, you know, how is this all magically connected? And when we just look at it, and, and I'm just going to give a, a, a very brief and basic overview, but, but let's understand that the, your eye is connected to the optic nerve. Uh, the optic nerve is then connected to all other nervous system tissue in the body. And all nervous system tissue obviously is connected to every part of your body. And then, but it's not just a one-way street. It's not just your iris to the eye, to the optic nerve, to the nervous system, to the body. It's a two-way street. So it's also every aspect of your body through the nervous system, through the optic nerve, making an impression on the iris of the eye. So it, it's really the iris to the body and then the body to the iris. And that's how we can utilize this tool to have an understanding of some of the potential underlying conditions that our clients could be dealing with so we can actually lead them down the next path to their ultimate healing. And first off, I want to get into, you know, let, let's stick with the, the basics first. And this is so interesting, too, because a lot of people, you know, like, uh, as an example, there might be people watching this right now who think that thinks that somebody has a green iris. And even though you may have seen a green iris, there really is not a green iris color. There's either a blue iris, which is known as, as a lymphatic iris. There is a mixture of blue and brown, which is known as a biliary. And then there's the brown iris, which is known as a hematogenic. And a little bit later, I'm going to tell you how we, when we look at irises, how one can appear to be green or one can appear to be like a silvery gray color. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of understanding of how that comes to be as well. But always remember 
the three colors is either going to be blue, brown, or a mixture of the blue and brown. Now, the lymphatic or the blue iris, uh, this appears to be pr uh, primarily blue or it can have different shades such as like a blue white, a blue gray, a gray or a blue black or greenish iris is uh, based on other pigmentations over the blue. The physical predispositions for somebody with a blue iris is irritation of mucosal tissue and over acid body chemistry, uh, arthritic or rheumatic conditions or skin eruptions are some of the just generalized underlying conditions that some with blue irises can actually be more prone to rather than the brown or the mixed iris. And then thought and emotional dispositions are typically, uh, can be typically tied into emotional pain, forgiveness issues, diminished flexibility, and limited self-perception. Yeah, so these are some of the, the generalized uh, aspects you can utilize when you're actually looking at somebody with that blue iris or any of the ver versions of the blue iris as you saw in the first bullet point here above. Now, this is an example of a blue iris. And you can, and, and one of the things too that I want to be uh, clear on is because one of the reasons that ways that you can tell that it's a true blue iris is also looking at the, what's known as the colorette. We'll talk about that a little bit deeper later, but you can see in this picture, you see the pupillary border, and then you see that that line that you could almost trace that that runs out about a third of the way away from the pupillary border, and that's known as a colorette. And when the interior of the colorette is that lighter blue along with the blue on the outside, uh, then you're then you could actually be rest assured that that is a true blue iris. Now, with this one, and and I'm gonna just. I'm going to give little tidbits in all of these different pictures that we go through today so you can actually have, you know, a tool in your toolbox that you can at least use for reference for right now. And uh, the one thing that I'll say with this is a blue iris, and you can notice, though, that there's a lot of white in this iris. So if you saw this uh, just with the naked eye without this being, you know, blown up uh, through a microscope, uh, basically you would see an iris that looks like a silvery gray or a silvery blue. And what this is, that's the blue iris with a white haze, a white pigmentation over the top of the iris. And the white pigmentation, you might want to make a note of this, the white pigmentation is typically tied into an over acid body chemistry. Uh, now, that what's interesting though is I'm going to give you information a little bit differently than you hear in just like general information. Whereas most people think if you are if you're overly acidic, you're eating too much meat and you're not juicing enough or you're not eating enough greens. And this the, the other aspect of this iris that helps gives us some an, an indication of what could be going on as far as why the over, the over acid body chemistry is is potentially an issue. When you look at the pupil. The pupillary border should be a very fine, distinct black line. And you can notice with this pupil that the border, you can see the black leaking out into the iris, almost all the way around the pupillary border. Now, that pupillary border, when the black is leaking out into the iris, is often tied into low stomach acid. So this is what gets really interesting with this you know, in your practice, is that if you've got somebody that has low stomach acid, they're typically not breaking down their protein well they're not breaking down and absorbing and assimilating minerals or B vitamins, then their body becomes acidic. So I, I want to explain that because it, it can be confusing when on one hand you're saying, well, there's an over acid body chemistry. On the other end, you're saying there's low stomach acid. But recognizing that these are two, these are, these are really, you know, we're not even comparing apples to apples here. These are two different subjects. So the low stomach acid hindering proper digestion, which that, will then lead to an over acid body chemistry. So it so it's really interesting how you start to put all this together and then, you know, from my perspective, I would take that information and I would look deeper as to what's going on in their gut. I would most likely with a, a client like this, I would be uh, looking at a stool, uh, a GI screening for potential pathogens, and I might be suspecting something like H. pylori, which would more significantly uh, deplete the stomach acid. So you could see just one quick little picture how you can tell quite a bit right off the bat. 
So now the, the biliary or the mixture of the blue or the brown iris. Now, this is primarily a mixture of blue or brown iris genetics, which may in, uh, generate a light brown or a greenish color, a light brown to amber, a greenish amber with a brown center. And that's a, a key thing to remember from what I, I talked about in the last picture, but I'll bring this up again when we get to the next picture, uh, or various different combinations of all the different color schemes mentioned uh, above. Now, the physical predisposition for the mixed or the biliary iris is digestive challenges, liver and gallbladder congestion, pancreatic insufficiencies, and intestinal immune deficiency. And the thought and emotional predispositions tie into this as well. Now, this is an example, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very candid with this. This is a picture of my iris. And uh, I've got that biliary iris, a mixture of the blue and brown. And you can see you know, that part of the iris is brown, part of the iris is blue. And, uh, and I could, you know, with this, you could even see that the pupillary border is, is, uh, has a, a little bit of a brown curly line right around the pupillary border, uh, which could be a sign of poor carbohydrate metabolism. And some of the the brownish, uh, almost like speckles that you see on the outside, that could be uh, hemochromatosis tied into uh, poor utilization of iron in the body, or it's even been recognized, there's some new thoughts in iridology that sometimes that's just tied into uh, the toxic load that we're actually exposed to in our, our environment. So you start, to, and, and I'll give you one other uh, aspect with this is, you can see little rings going around the uh, mid portion of the iris, uh, almost going all the way around, and those are actually referred to as stress and tension rings. You, so that tells you that the potential that that client, uh, so this would be me, had been through some level of significant trauma earlier in their life that would have an effect on the iris of the eye. So you could start to, again, take all the little pieces of the puzzle and draw some, not and, and again, not as a diagnostic, but just to push you in a certain direction of understanding what's going on with your client, and that's the mixed or the biliary iris. All right, now the hematogenic uh, or brown iris <coughs> is this is really more of an even matte-like brown iris with a velvet smooth or textured finish that can range from light to dark brown or kind of a black brown as well. The physical predispositions are tied into uh, generally liver and gallbladder congestion, iron metabolism dysfunction, blood or glandular disorders, varicose veins, uh, digestive disturbances, and uh, potentially arterial sclerosis. Now the thought <coughs> and emotional predispositions for the brown iris are tied into anger, uh, resentment, repression of expression emotional fluctuations and difficulty receiving from others. So just by knowing the color, you can understand some, some generalized predispositions just by looking at somebody having either a blue, a mixed, or, or a brown iris. And here's an example of a brown iris. And yeah, let me, let me do one thing though. Uh, let me go back to the picture. I forgot to mention one thing. Remember, remember when I said the blue iris um, in the interior of what was known as a collarette, that area that's about the furthest of the way outside of the pupillary border. And, and I was like, well, you know it's a blue iris when inside the collarette is also that lighter color of the blue. And with this iris here, even though we see some blue, you would, you would, you would recognize that this is not truly a blue iris because of the brown inside the collarette, the darker color inside the collarette. So I wanted to bring that up because I, I made a point to bring up the lighter color in the blue iris, and I wanted to show you that difference here. So black, back to the brown iris. Now, the brown iris, now typically in the brown iris, when there's a, what's known as a stronger constitution, is the, the, the finish on the brown iris should be like a really matte finish. And you can notice in this iris, you still see what is known as trabeculi. And trabeculi are the little lines that go from the pupillary border to the iris border. And generally, on a, a brown iris, you can't see the trabeculi because there's the white, there's that matte finish over the brown iris. And you see it toward the, just outside of the collarette, but then when we get to the later part of this iris, you start to see the trabeculi actually appear. 
And with a really strong constitution for somebody with a brown iris, you would see a very velvety, almost like matte finish over the whole iris, and you wouldn't see any any of the trabeculae. But it's uh, uh, fascinating too with, with this one, I'll just give you a couple of other little tidbits. Notice that area of the collarette that I refer to is that little circle that goes out about a third of the way into the iris around the pupillary border. And notice that there's a lot of what, what looks like little uh, pits and depth tied into that. And those are one of the indicators that you can actually utilize to, again, point you in a direction of further testing or understanding with your clients. But when you see different pits or markings like this, that's generally going to be an area that's tied into either some genetic predispositions to weakness in that area, or when there's more depth when there's depth and then those uh, those uh, little uh, those pits or they're actually uh, uh, technically referred to as lacuna those will actually get deeper and as there's more depth it increases the likelihood that you're going to see a challenge here so this iris just by looking at it right off the bat uh, the first thing that i would be thinking is that there's some pretty potentially some uh, really chronic issues from a gastrointestinal perspective so again this would lead me into you're potentially doing a GI screening, maybe looking at leaky gut, food sensitivities, really trying to help this client uncover uh, what these potential issues are. So you can see that you get to use this for uh, you know, some information pointing you in the direction to assist your client. Now, understanding how to assess your constitution is significant. How to assess a strong or a weak constitution and really the positive aspects of both the strong and the weak. Uh, this is one thing that's really important for me when I'm working with my clients. Uh, I don't. I like to present it in a way that where strong and weak doesn't mean good or bad. It's just an expression of how their body deals with health challenges or emotional challenges. And I'll, you'll you'll see this as we look in these pictures. So this first iris, and and aren't they all just amazing looking? I mean, all the irises are just so beautiful in their own way. And this particular iris is what we would consider a very weak constitution. And the trabeculi, remember those lines in the iris that go from the pupillary border to the iris border, the closer or more tight-knit they are, typically the stronger the constitution. So what's interesting with this is when I have a client and I'm going through and I'm doing an iris reading and I've got their picture like this size on a computer that we're all looking at together, uh, and and th I usually do this in a first session with clients, so I don't really know them with with a lot of depth yet at this point. But I would actually, you know, recognizing the weak constitution, I would probably explain to this client, well, uh, let me just ask you some something about yourself. Is that when you, uh, let's say you you miss some sleep, or maybe you had a really stressful day, or maybe you didn't eat so you know that well over the last couple of days. Does your body really tell you, you know, so after a stressful day, do you really need to shut down and rest? And if you didn't get a good amount of sleep, is it really hard to make it through the next day? And when you get overwhelmed with stress, does it kind of push you over the edge? And generally that client will answer yes, because that's the response of a weaker constitution. And the gift of a weak constitution, though, is that when something has gone awry, when something is in balance, the weaker constitution, their body tells them right away. Yeah, so they really can't get away with much. So they, they really have to stay on a very uh, healthy, balanced path uh, overall to really maintain how they feel within their health. Yeah, so that's the weaker constitution. And you can see the difference here. Look at this iris. Look at how tight those lacuna, uh, the the, the uh, la lunas are. And again, those I, the lines that go from the pupillary border to the iris border. So this client, I would actually be telling them something on the order of, I would probably say, well, I don't really know you that well, but based on looking at your iris, you're most likely you're the you're you're the survivor. You push through. You break break through every barrier. You hurdle every wall. Uh, if you miss a little bit of, you know, a couple hours of sleep, you still function at a high level the next day. You can eat poorly and still function very well. You can, you know, and, and just, and when I explain that, almost 100% of the time they're like, well, yes, it's just amazing how you can tell that by looking at my iris. That's, that's the type of person I am. And that all sounds great, but there are some challenges to a strong constitution as well. Because a strong constitution 
doesn't have early warning signs typically. So they can make poor health have poor health choices and practices for long durations of time before it just hits them. It hits them like a ton of bricks. And and you know the things that I hear from clients that have strong constitutions when they've actually pushed past this for so long, they'll say things like, "Oh, I don't, I didn't." Yeah, you know, this just came up on me all of a sudden. I didn't even notice that I even had this issue. But it's not that they didn't have the issue, but they didn't have the signs for their body to really tell them. And and the other thing that I tell the stronger constitutions is that uh, you, you know they could take stress to a really high level. And you see, when you have a strong constitution, uh, as as a, a client or you know just even yourself as a person. You typically take on high amounts of stress, and do you know why? Because you can. Except the problem with people who have strong constitutions is they're pushing their stress levels to higher than is actually healthy for them. So I tell all of my clients with really strong constitutions is that you have to figure out what is a uh, an acceptable level of stress for you, and then you have to consciously keep your stress below that. Because if you're always pushing yourself to a level of stress to where you feel it, with a strong constitution, you're pushing it far beyond what would typically be healthy. And and the variances of the lines, basically this one, which is the strong constitution, and this one, which is the weak, obviously there's variances in between those, which would be somebody who is a little bit between the weak and the stronger constitution. Uh, now, the next one, next uh, subject is tied into the colon reflex of health. I mentioned the collarette uh, earlier, which is uh, the area that I mentioned uh, just around the outside of the pupillary border. And so we'll use this to help you understand what your iris can tell you about the colon or really uh, any aspect of the gastrointestinal system because you know, it's the colon reflex of health is, is both a physical and emotional component. And and when we think of this from a colon perspective, uh, and, and there's a lot of practitioners who say, you know, good health or optimal health starts in the gut. And basically, when there's something going on in the colon because of the colon reflex of health, it does have an impact uh, basically holistically in the body, and it also ties in emotionally. Because as we go through uh, these pictures today and we see other areas where there's potential concern for somebody, there's all the different emotional components as well. And when you talk about any type of emotional uh, stress or traumas or suppressions that people are dealing with, uh, any negative emotion has an impact on the colon specifically, as well as other areas of the body. And here's, here's an example of where we're looking at, uh, again, that cholerate and tied into the colon reflex of health. So now we see that color at, and again, you see the line you could you could actually trace. You want to be able to see the line. You don't want to see it too faint or too dark. Either one of those could be potential challenges tied into the colon. And, or to, well, not just the colon, but the, in the entirety of the gastrointestinal tract, the colon, the small intestine, and the stomach. Now, when you see this line around the pupillary border, you would like it to be a, a, an even line and again, up to about a third of the way outside of the pupillary border. So you can notice with this one where on the left side of this iris, it's extending out a little bit further uh, towards the top of the, the pupil, uh, toward the top of the iris, it's, it's getting in a little bit closer. And you can notice all of the uh, little, uh, these are referred to as lacuna, uh, where those, they, they almost look like little marquee shapes or little ovals on the left side of this iris. And there's some depth there. So this is somebody again who you would you would suspect that there's something going on from a gastrointestinal perspective, and then you're running the proper tests to help them understand what it is, and you could get them on a wellness protocol from that perspective. And here's another uh, again very different one, right? And look at this colorette, and look at how loose the laluna are through this. So. With this particular iris, this is somebody who I would not only rec you know, be you know, immediately recognizing the likelihood of, of the gastrointestinal challenges, but this is somebody because the laluna are really showing a really weak constitution. Uh, this is somebody who I would not only help them with understanding what's going on in their gut and providing a wellness protocol for their body to help overcome, 
but this is a client that I would be telling them based on what seems to be a, a, a predisposition genetically for gastrointestinal issues, even once we, you know, you actually get your body to the point where you can balance your gut and your GI, you'd still want to keep some long-term focus on caring for your gastrointestinal system even after you've done you're going through what you need to to balance and heal the gastrointestinal system. So you use the, the constitution as a level of how long do they need to have care or is this something like, as an example with this picture, I'd be saying absolutely you need to do things to keep your gut healthy for the rest of your life. And it makes it a, a very simple uh, communication uh, with the client. And then here's one other example from another extreme. Now notice that the collarette, remember we were talking about that line that you could trace uh, outside of the pupillary border, but this line is very faint and even on the lower left hand side of, of this, of this uh, iris, you can't, you, it's even hard to make out the line. And notice how close this is really hugging the pupillary border. So this would be a different expression of somebody who I would feel that there's a likelihood of some genetic expression uh, for, for a predisposition for weakness in the gastrointestinal tract. So this is just a, a different example of really understanding the potential predispositions and being able to deliver you know, that, hey, you just really need to keep a strong focus on your gut health for the rest of your life. And one last example, and yes, you, and again, you can see the, the lines are very faint. And, and, and with this one, just a, 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 to note, you can see again where the uh, pupillary border, the black is leaking out into the iris, which is uh, typically tied into low stomach acid, and then also that white pigmentation uh, tied into uh, potentially the over acid body chemistry. This is another example of looking at the color up. And one last example here. Now, I wanted to bring this one up uh, in this picture specifically because the other thing that you pay attention to is if there's pigmentations in the area of the collarette. So this one's got an orangey pigmentation. Uh, the pigmentation itself, orange, ties into the, uh, generally could tie into the pancreas, and we'll talk about that a little bit deeper later. But when you see the pigmentation in the collarette, that's another sign of a potential challenge. And with this particular iris, you could see that it's hard to see the border of the colorette, and there's a lot of the lacuna, those those little markings that look like little ovals or little uh, uh, little marquee shapes, and there's a lot of depth. And when you see the depth, that typically uh, will tell you that it's it, it's potentially a deeper chronic issue. All right, now now tied into uh, into pigmentation. So, what is the pigmentation in the iris? Uh, and really what is the significance uh, or tied into the color of the pigmentation. If you see a, a light cream or a straw yellow pigmentation, it's tied into typically the kidneys. If you see a pinkish red or a light red pigmentation, it's usually tied into the gastrointestinal system. If you see an orange to a shiny orange, it's typically tied into the pancreas. If you see a, 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 a brown to a black brown, it's typically tied into the liver. And there's also significance of the location of the pigmentation as well. So let's look at some examples of this. So with this iris, you can see that there is a uh, orange pigmentation and then a brown pigmentation. So this would give me already some uh, underlying information of potentially looking at a potential of a, a pancreatic issue. Now this could be tied into blood sugar regulation problems, uh, insulin resistance, insulin surges. Uh, this could also be tied into the, uh, the pancreas's ability or inability to produce the proper enzymes for, for the digestive system. And then when you see the brown pigmentation, typically you're, you're thinking liver. So again, these just are signs that lead you into uh, deeper testing to really understand what this is telling you about the body. And here's another iris, and you can see uh, orange pigmentation, again, tied into the pancreas. You can see also a little bit of the, that, like that yellowish, like the straw yellow. So you would be thinking uh, potential kidneys, and then also that brown pigmentation uh, tied into the liver specifically. And with this iris, the one area that's a little bit different, the area on the outside of the iris, 
where you see those little like yellowy orange almost like little pillows or little clouds on that outside uh, so the pigmentation does tie into as mentioned uh, just a, a moment ago uh, the the yellow tied into the kidneys and the pancreas potentially tied into the uh, pancreas the orange tied into the pancreas but also where they're at those pigmentations are, are really hang out in the area that's tied into the lymphatic system because the expression of the lymphatic system is around the outside of the iris and just the outside of the collarette. And you can no notice that both of those areas, there's a pretty strong pigmentation. So this is a, uh, this is, would be a client that you'd be suspecting that they might have a little bit of a slow movement in their overall lymphatic system. So I might be recommending for a suggestion of maybe lymphatic massage or jumping on a rebounder or doing dry skin brushing from the extremities of the body toward the heart uh, and, and or maybe even some uh, herbal or homeopathic support to really assist with their lymphatic system. And then one more with the pigmentations, you can see the orange and the yellowish, so tied into the pancreas and kidneys and then the white, uh, as mentioned earlier, tied into the over acid body chemistry as well and one more and you, you can see all of these are potentially so different right and uh, with and I'll give you give you a little bit of an overview of some things that we've gone through already so we're looking at the uh, the the space with the uh, with the La Lunas, the lines in the iris, so there's a bigger space. So we'd be thinking this is a person with a, a maybe a little bit of a weaker constitution. We're noticing the tightness of the collarette, so we would be suspecting some potential uh, GI challenges. And then we see the pigmentations of brown, yellow, and also the orange, and also the white. So we'd be thinking potentially, uh, let's look deeper into what's going on with the liver, the pancreas, the kidneys, and then with the over acid body chemistry as well. Now here's a, this is a fantastic chart. This is a chart that I actually use, a much larger version of this in my office with my clients. Uh, this breaks down the body as it shows up on the iris of the eye. And now I'm I'm not getting extremely deep into all the individual aspects of this. I mean, uh, for the level of training that I've had in in holistic iridology, I've gone through three certification programs and then a diploma level program to really get to the point where I understand this in the way that I can so easily talk about this today. Uh, but this is something that. Um, just so you can use for your own, you know, just reference and and understanding of where different things show up in the iris of the eye. I've been talking a lot about the color rep because that seems to be a, a pretty common challenge that most of us see with clients tied into the gastrointestinal system on some level and uh, some of the easier things to really understand from an iridology perspective. But that gives you an example. And one, one other little tidbit I'll add into this is the the right iris is actually tied into the right side of the body and the left iris is tied into the left side of the body and the left iris is more of you see underneath the, the pictures of, of each iris you see the feminine or masculine so the left iris is tied generally into more feminine energy which we would think of as emotional creative and uh, feeling energy whereas the right iris of the masculine would be potentially tied into more uh, what we consider male energy, more knowledge, intellect based. And so sometimes you could even see some different variances from one iris to the next based on some uh, deeper underlying mental or emotional uh, aspects of their journey they're going on as far as uh, what your client's looking to achieve. And then the markings. I've, I've mentioned the word lacuna a few times. So lacuna is again it looks like either a little oval or typically a marquee shape or maybe a leaf is another way to explain this and there's a varying significance with different lacuna and the location of the lacuna also has significance as well so here's some uh, examples of lacuna and you can see on the lower right and then the or I'm sorry on the lower left and then on the left side of the cyrus and then in the kind of the corner towards the upper right uh, those are examples of lacuna. Now, these lacuna, uh, just to be very clear, when you have a, a bigger lacuna that doesn't have a lot of depth, that's not really much of it. You know, that I would be thinking, well, yes, there's a genetic, potentially a genetic 
predisposition for this person in those areas. But there's not a lot of depth. When you, when you see more depth is when you really want to be serious about helping them uncover this because we all have predispositions. There's all, I've never seen what I would consider a perfect iris. I'm open to someday seeing that, but honestly, in the uh, in the years that I've been doing iridology, I haven't seen the genetic predispositions getting stronger. I've been seeing them getting weaker. So everybody has those, including I had some on my iris that we looked at earlier. Uh, but but when you see the depth is when you really want to. Uh, make sure that you're giving the recommendations to look deeper with testing to understand this. But this would be somebody who I would say, yes, there's some genetic predispositions, uh, but they don't appear to be driving a significant issue right now. Uh, but if you've done a proper intake with your client and uh, you've had a, a very interesting conversation, you might understand that maybe something is going on in an area where it's showing some genetic predisposition. And I will also say, when the lacuna is bigger like this, it, that's much less problematic than a small, deep lacuna. And I'll, I'll have a picture of that coming up. And here's some uh, a different expression of lacuna. We could see one on the uh, lower portion of this iris, a, a larger lacuna. A little bit of depth, but not too bad. And then you can see some, and there's multiple lacuna throughout this iris, uh, but you can notice that there's not a lot of depth in that bigger one on the bottom. But look at toward the top. You've got some the top and then the, the, the upper corner and the upper right. You can see some lacuna that are smaller and darker. So remembering that the darker lacuna, the deep, the more depth you're actually witnessing, which then gives you a another indicator that this might be a deeper chronic challenge. So you want to help them uh, look a little bit deeper with some testing and understand what's going on here and get them on the proper wellness uh, protocol. Or even sometimes this, this is a sign of where you would even recommend somebody to uh, a conventional physician. And and I'll give you an example of this. I, I was doing a, I was in a part of a health fair. Uh, this was years ago now at this point, but I remember uh, doing these little iris readings for people at the fair, and there was a woman who had significant, deep, dark, small lacuna over four areas that are uh, would be uh, corresponding to the pancreas and some significant orange pigmentation. And I recommended to the woman, I said, I said, you know, I would recommend that the next time you go to their doc your doctor, and I would even recommend this soon, go to your doctor and ask your doctor if if that your doctor he or she can test for uh, glucose and for insulin. And uh, lo and behold, literally two weeks later, she showed up in my schedule at my office because she went to her doctor, she ordered that test, and unbeknownst to her, she was immediately diagnosed as a diabetic because of her glucose and her her insulin reading and but she had no physical symptoms of this it was just looking at the iris and making a recommendation and then you know she was so just amazed that I was able to pick this up in her iris that you know she ended up coming in and working with me and we went down a natural route to help her overcome that here's a, a close up and, and, and here you can see some of the lacuna in this iris uh, and that one on the lower right. And this, this is an example, that lower right uh, corner here the, where we see that one lacuna, that is the area that's tied, one of the four areas tied into the pancreas. Uh, so when you see that and then you, there's depth to it, you can see the depth in it and then you see the orange pigmentation. So this is somebody who you're suspecting some uh, blood sugar issues, some you know maybe high glucose, poor blood sugar regulation, insulin resistance, insulin surges. Yeah, you know, potentially they've uh, if they went to a conventional physician, they would have a diagnostic of maybe type two diabetes. But it just gives you something to look a little bit deeper. And uh, Roberto Coplin mentioned, never judge, just be with what is, which is important when you're looking at irises in your practice. Because when you look at this iris, this is where it's important to not judge. Uh, you don't want to look at an iris with a client and and be like, oh, or oh, that's that's really bad, or anything like that. Because there's there really is no good or bad of an iris. Now, when he would look at this iris, I would actually see multiple challenges going on. I would see a really weak constitution. 
I would see if you look on the bottom of there, there's some really deep dark lacunas so there's probably some chronic challenges uh, uh, just because of my level of knowledge I mean I know that that's adrenal and kidney and uh, this could also be tied into the hip leg knee uh, calf uh, ankle and foot as well it's got like a flower petal look to this iris uh, generally that flower petal look uh, there's some uh, pre predispositions to hormonal imbalance but there's potentially a lot going on but it's all this really does is again it's not good or bad it's not to be judged it's just recognition of where somebody is and gives us the opportunity to look deeper and and to to have a tool like this that helps you look deeper and gives you the the, the really the knowledge and the reasons and understanding of this uh, is really priceless for everybody that you would utilize this with Here's a, another one, and you can see multiple lacuna on the outside. We see stress rings. We see some potential challenges with the gastrointestinal system. We see multiple pigmentations, some deeper dark lacuna. Uh, but again, it's just an expression of where they're at. And, and the more tools you have in your toolbox to really help your clients understand potentially what's going on so you can help them really build and put together a wellness protocol for them to find balance it's, it's really an invaluable tool and dr. David Pesic who I stunned study under uh, with uh, holistic iridology uh, he has he mentions love and wisdom creates our masterpiece and with that I'd like to uh, give my next thank you uh, to again to Hawthorne University for providing the opportunity for me to share this information and to help you expand your own knowledge for not only yourself personally but also utilize some of this and taking it into your practice as well. Thank you, Glenn. No, you're welcome. My pleasure. We're ready for some questions. I just have. I'm just stunned at the variation of the eyes. You know, I got <laughs> right. I just got lost in them. I mean, right away when you said, you know, aren't these magnificent or something? I'm like, yes. You know, I had comments about each one. Um, it was very powerful to to see them on screen like that. Yeah, and that's the that's the advantage of I've got. Uh, I've, I I utilize a uh, a microscope <clears throat> that has a digital camera attached to it. That's, and yeah. it, it even gives you that that uh, ability to do those some of those close-ups uh, that that we were looking at there as well. That was my next question: is, is what camera do you use? If there yeah, was anything yeah. special that that you do with this, and and so for people that don't have a microscope camera, what do you suggest? Well, I you know when I started this, you know, I mean, you know, iridology for you know thousands of years was done by you know looking through a, a magnifying glass. Yeah, so somebody could use a magnifying glass on a little flashlight, and mm -hmm. what you could do with that is, you know, when back before I had the camera, I would have a client in front of me, and I would say, just stare at the bridge of my nose. Mm -hmm. I would hold up the magnifying glass over the iris, and I would take the 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 light, the flashlight, kind of like from the side of their head, and just move it a little bit forward until I can get enough light on there to to really see that, and then I would. I would look at it and take some notes, look at it again, take some notes of, of the areas that I would see everything. Uh, but but as yeah, as my uh, my education in this advanced and then obviously my equipment advanced and even getting to the point where not only having the camera but having a, a program where you can take the picture of the iris on your computer and then you can lay out the the map of the body over the iris and and the, the the so it's just it's phenomenal what you can do with this when you you, you put together the education and knowledge with some of the technology but there's nothing wrong with looking out a through a, a microscope uh, not a microscope a magnifying glass and using a flashlight and what what can you see if you're just looking into somebody's eyes without any magnification Oh, you know, sometimes more than you want to, uh, and I say that because because it's uh, knowing these things. You know, is sometimes uh, you know it's it to me it, it's always a blessing, but sometimes it feels like a curse as well because I could be as an example, I could be standing in line at the theater waiting to get in the show, and you know, really waiting to get a ticket for the show, and just 
strike up a conversation with somebody next to me and you, you can see things, you see the, the colors, you know, I might see an iris of somebody has a green iris, which, a, and a green iris, I, I, I never got into that. A green iris is a blue, is really a blue iris with a yellow pigmentation over it. So whenever I see a green iris, I'm already thinking, you know, there's there's potentially some kidney challenges going on here. And, and, then, and then I also think a little bit deeper because there's different emotional components for all this too. So uh, whereas typically in, in holistic iridology, the kidney is, uh, are, are really referred into a lack of forgiveness, just like the brown pigmentation, I would think of anger, uh, uh, or the brown pigmentation would uh, be tied into um, anger and then would also tie into like liver, gallbladder, thyroid. So there's so much you could see just by having a conversation with somebody and 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 for me i've learned years ago you know when i first started in this business like almost two decades ago i thought it was my job to save the world and then i realized <laughs> as i'm trying to tell everybody who's not asking me questions potentially what's going on i realized that well, i'm just going to lose a lot of friends and people that i hang out with so <laughs> so I, I so i obviously only share things with people who seek my attention but that's good. the thing that's where sometimes is a problem because you want to say something but it's really not our place unless they're asking of course yes of course and you know it, it is a challenge you know once you know i've been trained in and and seeing various body signs, you know, whether that's nails or or teeth or tongue, mm -hmm. and, and here with the eyes or or like an ear crease. I don't right. want to go. Oh no! You know, no. Yeah, you, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and you want to, but uh, it's it's the. Uh, I think that's the part of the growth and a practice to know that you know it it really isn't our job to save everybody, just to help help save people who come to us. Yes, keep your keep your eyes and your jaw from dropping whenever you can. <laughs> right. You know, I wish you'd had a pointer as you went through this, Glenn, um, just to I, identify. Is you know, you're so swift and so keen with it, and we're hearing these terms for the many of us for the first time. So, um, but I think that you provided some really great questions to ask, and I thank you for that. You know, when you're looking at various components of it to to have specific things to, to draw the, the the client out to, mm -hmm. to learn to gather more information from is really really very helpful um, you know wondering about the iris and how much it changes I mean does it change day to day if day-to-day -day circumstances change like diet lifestyle and stress well a uh, yeah, good question and and like this some things can if some things don't change like where if there's genetic predispositions there's there's genetic predispositions they'll always mm -hmm. be there uh, as an example the lacuna those those uh, little markings that look like either a uh, a marquee or an oval mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. a, a leaf of a tree mm -hmm. those could those could darken or lighten based on progression of health but typically the lacuna itself doesn't go away uh, the pigmentations can change. They can lighten or darken. Uh, some things like the, uh, that pupillary border I had mentioned where the, the black is leaking, you know, where it sh should be a very fine, distinct black line. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes when the black is leaking out in the iris over time, but this is, now we're talking probably months with this, where when they've finally gotten to the point where their stomach acid is being produced on a healthier level and their gut mm -hmm. is healing, you'll see some of these uh, areas come back. And I've even seen people who've had, you know, they, they when they were younger, they had a vibrant, beautiful blue iris, and then they've got this over acid body chemistry now and these gut issues, and you help them, you know, really create that wellness protocol to, to allow the body to find its balance again. And then you see that white pigmentation uh, really start to dissipate and then you see that vibrant blue iris again so it's it's really and even with my iris that I showed towards the beginning yeah because most people you might not know that you know a part of a part of what I do and what drives my passion is I, I probably would have been like one of my worst clients if I think back <laughs> like 30 years ago and uh, <laughs> my on my my uh, driver's license when I was younger it it said that my eyes were uh, hazel, mm -hmm. and and now you see a lot of the blue in the iris because a lot of the challenges that I had when I was younger for my health 
that came out as an expression with different pigmentations, the pigmentations had uh, started to dissipate and some of that natural color of the iris began coming out again. So it's, 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 it's really interesting. And oh, and with that, let me, let me uh, kind of uh, end a thought here because I've, I've seen some people who, who do iridology and uh, hold themselves as experts. I've, I've heard people in the past say things like, uh, if you, uh, if you cleanse people long enough, everybody has a blue iris. That's just not true. Uh, right. There's either the blue mixed or brown. So if you have a brown iris, it doesn't mean you need cleansing until it turns blue, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but No, but if it's green, I mean, you know, as you're saying with the green has, it shouldn't be green. Right, right. Yeah, green is a is a, the yellow pigmentation over that. And, and really any of the other variations that take you away from the natural color are mm -hmm. some deeper things to understand and, and again even just looking through the magnifying glass or or, or I'll even have uh, you know and the, the other thing that can be done is you could even take uh, pictures with a, a, like a macro setting on a on a, a, a decent camera and bring those pictures just uh, up on the computer just like I did here Interesting. Um, do you have a, any examples of dark brown eyes the question is are they harder to read they're uh, they're harder to well no uh, they're harder from the perspective of they're different than the blue or the mixed iris because you, you, a, a, a really a, a really strong constitution of a dark brown or like a blackish brown uh, iris mm -hmm. you don't see the lacuna because they've got that velvety matte finish but the more velvety and matte like it looks like and you, where you don't see any openings on it typically is the stronger constitution but you'll still see the lacunas those will still be evident uh, you would uh, still see most of the markings and uh, the only thing that you typically don't see on the darker irises is, is uh, would be tied into pigmentations because of the 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 uh, the, the vibration of the darker color of the iris interesting um, this question if the size of the pupil has meaning um, she says her iris is always large her dad was a pharmacist and offered iridology at his pharmacy he was very ahead of his time but he was um, but her enlarged pupil always concerned him yeah the uh, you know typically you're 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 looking at different uh, uh, it, it could be simply just tied in different stress levels of somebody who is uh, more more chronically stressed you might see like a really small pupil mm -hmm. and uh, and if there's really not that I would say that it too deep of a you know it's nice for the body to bear, be in a parasympathetic response but even when the, the pupils are are too large like I, I know that's one of the concerns if somebody has a, a, a head trauma you know, mm -hmm. uh, noticing the pupil but uh, so yes it, it does it does have some some bearing on um, what's potentially going on with the health. Um, yeah, stress of some sort. You know, often, right. it'll, um, when I <laughs> parents of teenagers will use it as a tool to, to determine if their children are on. Well, yes, yeah. There's that. There's there's that as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think you should come back and teach a course on this for us, to Glenn. That would, uh, it would be something that would provide a lot of information for sure. Yeah, I think so. So one of the questions is how long does it take to become certified in this? At a basic level and then at, at your advanced level, it started <laughs> the continuum. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm trying to re remember that. Um, I, it was so many, I've, I've been doing, I learned this years ago. Uh, but with, uh, with my training with Dr. Uh, David Pesek, uh, I know that the the certification levels were were online courses, and it was months of studying, and then and then there were at the end there were there were different tests that you had to take. The, the diploma level, uh, which you can only take after you've achieved the first three uh, certification programs. Uh, was was a lot of online education, but then uh, at that level, you had to go in for uh, I don't I don't remember exact days. I, I want to say it was a five or six day training where you literally you probably looked at three thousand irises over that time, Amazing and where, where you got into the 
uh, actual assessments, uh, you know, live and, and live instruction. Okay. Um, I appreciated the, the chart that you provided that had the associations. I wonder if there's others. I mean, talk about your equipment and being able to lay a whole body map over it. Mm -hmm. Are there other, you know, various charts that would um, correspond to IRIS and its variations to different health associations? Yes. Uh, there, well, there's, there's even uh, searching on the internet will provide uh, multiple different types of charts, uh, potentially even the one that I have there with the holistic iridology. Yeah. Somebody can search that. Uh, but, uh, and, and they're all, they all should be pretty close. You, know, you don't think there, you think there's a chance of something being unreliable? There's, uh, I've never seen anything that I would say, oh, this is way off or, mm -hmm. you know, mo most of the charts that you're going to see out there, the, the basic information is, is generally the same. Uh, the, the one by, with the holistic iridology, the one part that was a little different with that is Dr. Pusick was working with, uh, Bernard Jensen, who, who was kind of like the the who's who of iridology in the U.S. Exactly, through yeah. the through the 1900s, and uh, Dr. Pusick was uh, 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 apprenticing under uh, under uh, under his uh, tutelage uh, back in the day, mm -hmm. and toward the end of this, because Dr. Pusick's degree was he was he had a doctorate in psychology, so they were starting to put together uh, with him and. Uh, Bernard Jensen together, or Dr. Jensen, they were putting together not only the functional aspect, but also the whole mental emotional. And th that's why I was drawn to studying with Dr. Pesek because, you know, I'm always interested in not just the physical health, but also mm -hmm. what's going on mentally, emotionally, uh, vibrationally, and energetically in the body as well to help with healing. And uh, so I was really drawn to, to that understanding uh, uh, just because of, uh, you know, the, the holistic aspect of that. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. You know, I want to come back, swing back around, and and just frame this again about you know how we can use this based on this information, and and uh, you know I think it's important that we maintain our, our our general approach to our our practices. You know, for seeing somebody for the first time, that you would do a complete intake, and then at some point bringing this in as a component of an assessment. It's like for me when I see somebody the first time, that's when I determine what additional um, assessments or testing may be needed um, and then you know certainly use this a, 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 as a tool to, to lead us into um, other testing that may be beneficial to get more um, I think a medical determination you know behind this but you know your example of the woman that you saw at the fair and mm -hmm. and you didn't diagnose from that. You just said, you know, this may be an issue, and you should go talk to your doctor about it and have right. him run these tests. And when he did, then you know she got that information and came. And interestingly, came back to you, right, for for the approach to deal with it, right? Um, yeah, and that's and and sometimes, and that's the thing. And that this is you know, and, and for those who learn this and, and and at least have the basics down, it's it's just a it's a, a great way to show the knowledge that we have from a holistic perspective as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that not everything has to be a blood test and a diagnosis is that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we can understand, you know, some likelihoods of, of challenges and, and it's nice to be able to, you know, there is a time where we want to recommend people to conventional medicine. You know, you don't want to, you know, it's, it's not really in our space to, you know, feel like we're going to tackle everything, no. you know, and, and sometimes when you see the markings, the iris, it might it might push us towards that recommendation. A absolutely, and you know, having somebody come in already with a diagnosis, I mean, having a, having a medical diagnosis is, you know, for for our scope of practice, we're not diagnosticians. Right, right, we exactly. We don't diagnose right. or treat, and so we're here to to assess and support. And in this regard, I think it's a valuable tool and. And it's, I'm I'm thrilled to have it in my in my toolbox certainly over the years. So I want to thank you, Glenn. I think this was a mighty fine presentation, and it um, really sets the stage for an additional piece that we can use here. Oh, my pleasure. It's it's always uh, it's always a joy to uh, uh, share this information with uh, the Hawthorne students, alumni, and uh, and and really some of the uh, guests and general public as well. 
faculty too. And we have yeah, some exactly. <laughs> it's, it's all relevant. So I have some closing comments. Um, just a couple minutes, everybody. I want to remind you that the webinar was recorded and it'll be available up on our Hawthorne's website under archived webinars. It'll just take a few days. And there's a survey to fill out as we end this webinar. And it, it really helps us to have your feedback and any comments about this presentation. And, and certainly appreciate you taking the time. I want you to have confidence that I look at this carefully. And a reminder that our next um, webinar is with David Crow. It's a two-part presentation on combining herbs and essential oils. That'll be March 5th and 19th. And then our All About Alumni next is Wednesday, March 6th, with MSHN grad Jill Morande. And she's going to be presenting about her post-grad activities. And that's going to be an exciting presentation coming up. And so I hope we've inspired you here today to learn more about health and nutrition with the webinars that we've offered over the years and this one. And remind you about Hawthorne's variety of programs that we offer and encourage you to visit our website for more details. And if you're ready for more personalized attention, Kathy McDermott is our Director of Attention and always ready to offer some support and answer questions. And I just want to thank James Bernard and Nelly for engineering these webinars and always having my back. And with that, I'm going to say this concludes today's presentation. So thank you again, Glenn. No, it's my pleasure. I want to thank everybody for sharing this educational experience with us. And I wish you all the best of health. I certainly look forward to learning more together at Hawthorne University's webinar and all about alumni series and in our programs here at Hawthorne. And until then, I'm going to continue to practice compassion and kindness and iridology. Iridology. <laughs> we're talking about eyes, not ears. So what we practice grows stronger. So I hope you'll join me in this too. Take care, everybody. <laughs>